Okay, welcome to the 55th episode of an Evolving Man podcast. Today I'm excited to be speaking to Dino Nocivelli. Uh, Dino is a partner in the abuse department at Lee Day Law Firm and joined the company in 2022. Dino specializes in actions for child sexual abuse survivors. Dino has appeared in a significant number of media publications, providing his expert opinion and commentary including, among others, the BBC, ITV and The Guardian. He has also provided evidence to the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse, the ICSA. Welcome, Dina. Thanks, Piers. Thank you for having me. Yeah. So I like to say at the beginning how I kind of come across people. And I believe we were on Twitter together and I saw quite a few of your posts and I then went on to your website and listen to some interviews and I thought oh, I'd, I'd love to speak to you so thank you so much for agreeing to to be you know to, to, to speak to me thank you no problem at all so how I love to begin the podcast is just for you to share a bit about your background and how you got into the work you're now doing yeah so um I became a lawyer about 10 years ago when I qualified um, I've always been keen and, and wanted to help people to make a difference uh, and to create change if possible. And that's how I came into the area of, of abuse law, um, 2011, 2012. Um, and since then, I've specialised in representing victims and survivors of abuse. And alongside the work I do on a daily basis, um, you're right, and I've done lots of media work to try to help to raise awareness. I work with num numerous charities and also politicians to try to enact change. I think it's really important, not only what we do day per day, but actually how do we improve tomorrow mm -hmm. and how do we make sure children are safer? One of the key things which I've picked up along my life, my career is that um, far too often sometimes we depict abusers as monsters. Mm -hmm. What we should instead be looking at is actually the system which allows those monsters in essence to operate in the daytime, in open sight, for a number of years and abuse a number of different children and if the system fails if good people do bad things that's when we have a problem and what we want to try to do if possible is to improve the system so the good people can do good things and we can keep the bad people the abusers out of the system and the system is normal life whether at schools religions sport children's homes we want to try to do that and, and prevention is really important to me at the same time with my job I work with abuse survivors who sadly have suffered abuse mm -hmm. and I want to try my absolute best to do them. But that's the reason why I've entered the law and that's what I want to do over the next however many long I've got left on this planet is mm -hmm. try to improve it and, and try to make some of those changes happen quicker. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Was there one specific thing when, you know, when I was at university, I went to business school, I had different forms of law was there a point at law school you were like mm, this is was, the area i want to work in yeah it was a bit of a divide actually i i always been interested in litigation and i think coming from my my background as a um sort of come from a working class background mm -hmm. you know the crime has always been quite the forefront of my mind actually mm -hmm. um at the same time i can speak a number of different languages and corporate law also interested me. So when I first entered law, actually, I became a corporate lawyer and I hated it. I actually <laughs> hated it. It's um, everyone has different interests and different views. But I thought, you know, become a corporate lawyer. You know, I can travel and speak my languages and do this work. And it was just so devoid of any interest for me personally. I just found it very um, boilerplate like and and not making a difference in my personal view and I appreciate it's different for others so that's when I did change litigation and um, uh, I did some work within family law I did some work in relation to employment mm -hmm. and then when Savile came um, and I could see the kind of pain and suffering which is quite different to what I'd known about or experienced previously I understand if you have a car accident if you lose a loved one if you have a, a marriage breakup, if you injure yourself in a workplace, for example, you know, you lose your hand in an accident. I understand that immediate trauma mm -hmm. and people understand it. What's interesting about abuse and it's interesting in a slightly strange manner, perhaps, but these injuries and the impact isn't seen. Mm -hmm. It's uh, 
unseen majority, Sadi, who suffer psychiatric and mental health injuries. Mm -hmm. And the ability to, to be able to do that is something which I've always found quite perplexing. And that's why I talk about the system. I, I studied history at A level and I was going to consider to do it at university, but I didn't in the end. But when you look at someone like Adolf Hitler and what he mm -hmm. did do and how he was able to manipulate and groom an entire nation, and again, talking about good people doing bad things, I did lots of studies and, and analysis, really, of how did good Germans do extremely evil things. Mm -hmm. And it's similar to abuse, actually, when we talk about cover-ups or talk about negligence or talk about people not, you know, acting on allegations of abuse, whether it's in boarding schools or the Catholic Church, wherever else. Mm -hmm. That I find very um, concerning. And that's mm -hmm. something which I'm really keen to work on. So answering your question directly, I'm not a politician or not yet anyway. Um, we looked at corporate law first, didn't interest me. So I went into litigation because, again, those needs to, to change, to make a difference. And I think with abuse, there's so many things which we need to do. I think it's much better than 2011, 2012. In the last decade, it has improved. But there's still issues, whether it's with the criminal justice system, whether it's about the provision for mental health compared to physical health, mm -hmm. um, people being believed, things being acted on soon enough. Mm -hmm. There's still problems, sadly, um, and it's still difficult for abuse survivors to disclose and to be listened and to be acted on. So that's why I've chosen this area of law to kind of devote my life to, I suppose, my career to as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I really resonate with that. You know, how did good people do these bad things? You know, so what comes to me, you know, what I'd love, you know, you to share a bit more is, yeah, just speak a bit more about your work with child sexual abuse. Some of the cases that you've been putting together. I know you I can't obviously speak about much, but, you know, what's happening at the moment? Uh, you say it's changed from 2011. In what way? So I think... Um, sadly, when we talk about abuse, often we look towards the kind of key peaks or, or scandals, for want of a better phrase. So when we look at Savile, 2011, 2012, when we look at um, Me Too, when we look at Everyone's Invited, when we look at uh, abuse within football with Barry Bernal and others, mm -hmm. those often give people hope in it we can talk about this and we will be believed. And that's very important. I think when I first entered the abuse law field, um, it I perhaps didn't appreciate how prevalent abuse was mm -hmm. in that um, the numbers are scary, mm -hmm. um, not just in relation to the age or the time period or the actual number of survivors, but actually also where the abuse took place. Mm -hmm. So I come from a... Um, an Italian family, as you probably can guess from my name. Mm. Um, my parents are, are Catholic, um, Italian. Um, and my mum, bless her, always said, you know, don't take sweets of random strangers in the park. Mm. But she never said, be careful around the Catholic priest or by your football coach or your swimming teacher mm. or your maths or English or your primary school teacher. Um, I never went to the scouts, but she wouldn't have definitely not said about a scout master either. Mm. And it was always stranger danger. And that's one of the biggest myths that mm. exists, actually. Abuse nearly always happens by someone you know and you trust. Mm. And that's how it takes place. And I think that when I first considered entering this area, we all know, or lots of us know about abuse within the Catholic Church, for example, mm. or perhaps boarding schools, mm. but not the full extent. So when you look at the organizations, unfortunately, I have had to sue from state schools to residential, private boarding schools to Church of England, Catholic Church, you know, other religions, um, Scout Association, abuse within football and cricket and tennis and athletics and swimming and numerous other sports, um, abuse by police officers within the fire brigade, um, within uh, the NHS, doctors, nurses, within children's homes, abuse of young people, abuse of those with disabilities, abuse of elderly people, um, abuse of males, abuse of females, uh, abuse within the family home. It's nearly every area of society, unfortunately, there has been abuse. And it's 
that is quite um, shocking, to be frank. Mm. So, you know, stranger danger, don't take sweets from a stranger. Probably actually never, ever happens. Mm. Um, and it's all these other people who you trust and respect and you go along your normal daily life with. And I think entering the field, that is quite shocking. I think we are getting better at understanding as a majority. And remember, criminal cases still dealt with by juries. So you're not going to be dealt with by someone who's a fully informed psychologist or psychiatrist or someone who's a legally, as a lawyer, legally trained or anything like that. Um, and we all have biases. I understand that. But actually still, sometimes when I'm doing talks and speaking to people, you're judged by your peers. And there's still this perception that, you know, why did you not say no? Why did you go back and suffer further incidents of abuse? There's mm -hmm. still that understanding which is not in place. So when we talk about the change of the last decade, um, I think people are understanding more, but mm. not fully. Mm. I think there still is victim blaming in place. The um, system as such, the criminal justice system, has ground to a halt. And you've seen lots of strikes by legal aid solicitors and barristers and other cuts. And I think we're understanding more, but words are always cheap and actions are expensive, not just financially, but also emotionally. And I think that for provision for abuse survivors, we aren't ready and we're not capable of dealing with that at the moment. And I think that the true number is much larger than what we know. You know mm -hmm. It is that cliche, the tip of the iceberg of those people who do come forward and disclose mm -hmm. abuse. But even for those, we're not ready. And I think that when we talk about epidemics and pandemics and the like, the issue of abuse survivors is quite large. And when someone hasn't had that ability to get treatment over 20, 30 years on average, the impact is obviously quite large, not just for themselves, but their families, mm. who I'm really keen to do, and I think people are understanding more of, is about the need to help those survivors to disclose, and once they do disclose, to act on it. You know, whether it's disciplinary, whether it's criminal, whether it's therapy, or all of them, mm. it's action. You know, two plus two should always equal four. Mm. At the moment, it's equaling a question mark, and that question mark is hanging over survivors. And I was hoping with ICSA, we can enact some of these recommendations to mm -hmm. move things on but again that's another question mark which we won't find out about for a couple of months actually what will the government do and when will this government do it which mm -hmm. is uh still outstanding right it's still outstanding because i wasn't thank you fascinating i wasn't sure with ixa when there was the the final ruling in october or november i thought you know because my understanding really was about the mandatory reporting which we can come on to i mm -hmm. thought that it was set in stone but it sounds like it's that there's some more decision making there. yeah unfortunately peers you would hope so 183 million pounds spent on it you'd think well this is job done um yeah. and yeah. sadly not the government has have said they've got six months to come back and comment on it so from november that's until april is that right roughly april may yeah. um and they will there's 20 recommendations. You picked up on one, mandatory reporting, which is very important. Mm. But there were probably comments on it. it. It's not done. It, it's not in place. So mandatory reporting, they could follow the recommendation. They could not. Um, they may say, yes, we will follow it. But as you know, with government and politics, these things take ages to do. Mm. So will it be done by end of 2023, 24, 25? Who knows? There's an election in 2024. Will the next government, if there is another government, sorry, which I should say, trying to be you know non-political, but if it is a new government, will they follow through? Will they do a different stance? And and I think that's a real issue. And those 20 recommendations may not be followed through. A good example at the moment is that there's supposed to be a victims commissioner. We have no person in place. Vera Baird KC was let go. There's been a replacement. With uh, Windrush, there's supposed to be someone in place Mm -hmm. So Braverman may not actually go through with that recommendation now. So it's not criticizing anyone politically. I'm trying to be totally neutral about this, but it is important that those recommendations are what they are, recommendations. The government may not follow through on them or they may not follow through in the terms described. They may be watered down. They may be improved, but we just don't know. And again, it's another thing which we're waiting for. Mm, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, because I followed the work of mandate now and realizing yeah. that mandatory reporting so if you know as i shared before we started recording about my school so during the time i was there the abuse was going on for decades 
but while I was there for 10 years, they never contacted the police. They kept it all in house. And then instead of firing these people, they just said, Oh, it's time for you to go. Mm. And all these teachers left in the middle of, um, of term. Now, what I didn't understand then was it wasn't mandatory that they had to report this and it's still not that case. And I can't believe that. Yeah. The mandatory reporting is one thing which I find extremely frustrating because Mm -hmm. if you know about abuse, you know, you should be under, you're definitely under a moral duty, I would say, to report on it, to act on it, to stop not only the abuse of that individual, but other children for obvious reasons. But there's no, you know, we can't rely on the morals of Catholic priests and teachers and the like, unfortunately, and other religions, Mm -hmm. because it just doesn't happen. And what we continue to see is these scandals, again, in quotation marks, of the same thing happening in different areas of society. And the one thing to consider about mandatory reporting as well, and and Mandate Now is a great organisation and I support the pursuit of this change and and their um, comments about what has been recommended by ICSA. But the one thing to consider is that the law can only be, in this instance, prospective rather than retrospective. Mm -hmm. So we'll protect children from the day it's implemented, from today onwards, dependent on the standard which is applied to the mandatory reporting. But from your school and others, those people have escaped um, criminal punishment, which is what should be in place. And for most states in America, Australia, Europe, they do have mandatory reporting. So if this was in France, then yes, they would be facing criminal uh, repercussions for, for failing to act on abuse, you know, in essence, aiding and abetting a crime mm-hmm. by not acting on it. In this country, no, it's a moral slap on the wrist, if that. Mm-hmm. And it's it's wrong, because actually, it reconfirms that view of the child in that, number one, I won't be believed, and even if I am believed, no one's going to do anything. Mm-hmm. Um, it's them against me, it's people in positions of power, trust and authority against me, a child. And it's not, unfortunately, inside your head because it plays out in reality, as shown in, in numerous uh, cases of schools and churches and the like. But they just don't act on it. Mm-hmm. And um, it means abusers can get away with it. And sometimes abusers die without facing criminal repercussions. Mm-hmm. And, and for a survivor, that nagging issue mm-hmm. can determine their life. You know, As soon as you are touched for the first time, your life goes down a different path often. Mm-hmm. And that resolution, that help at the age of 14 or 15 rather than disclosing your 40s which is what the average is mm. could be totally different you know you, you do better in your gcse's your a levels or wherever it was you know with total respect back in your days at o levels and the like you mm. may have gone to university you may not have done you may have had more steady relationships a better relationship with alcohol and drugs mm. all of that was taken away from you because those people who were in positions of power and trust didn't do what they morally should have done and in my view criminally should have done the mm-hmm. law needs to change this but mm-hmm. at the moment ICSA recommended something which i know mandate now is not in support of doesn't mm-hmm. go far enough in their view and i understand that point mm-hmm. but it's still just a recommendation it's not law in this country so this could be happening right now somewhere in a school let's say and, and it's still no legal repercussions for that in england could you describe what they've actually said for the mandatory reporting that mandate now aren't so happy with because i so, i've seen it and it yeah. doesn't really make sense so i'd love you to talk through that so it's a complex issue but one aspect is that if a child discloses to someone in a using a teach using a school as an example for my ease mm. if a child says to a teacher mr x has abused me mm. um the recommendation is that that teacher is then under a duty to report it to the authorities Mm. the issue is many children don't feel able to disclose the abuse but they may display symptoms they may become from a straight a student go to straight to use Mm. overnight or over a couple of weeks they may become disruly they may start um, becoming disruptive not listening to their teachers and people in positions of trust. They may start developing alcohol, drug issues, self-harm issues. Obviously it's difficult because there's teenagers and things can change, but often that transition from good to not so good is something which teachers be picked up on. There may be concerns that certain teachers are seeing pupils overnight or taking them backwards and forwards to school, um, seeing them by themselves, or pupils are leaving a teacher's room in tears. All of these are kind of warning signs. 
the recommendations don't state you should report those concerns. You know, why is this child going to this teacher after school hours and coming out in tears or upset or distressed or why have they gone from straight A to drinking drugs and, and truanting over a term? Why? There's that question, why? It may not be abuse, but, you know, you can often pick up on warning signs. There's no legal duty and there's no legal recommendation to report those concerns, those changes, things you may be a bit worried about, or rumours, um, or nicknames for teachers. Lots of these teachers had nicknames, which indicate something sexual, for want of a better phrase, or something inappropriate. Yeah. No, that's not a, a, a disclosure of abuse to you as a teacher. So again, you're not under a duty to report according to the recommendations. So even though it was a starting, um, what's the... Um, uh, university challenge, you know, started for 10, whatever the phrase is. Yeah, yeah. It's a good start for 10. Good. Does it go far enough? No, but it's a starter. And I think for mandate now, I understand why actually just the practicalities of abuse in that generally speaking, children don't disclose mm. um, at the time of the abuse, but they may display symptoms. And what they want is for those symptoms to be um, alarm bells or red lights or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. And to to, you know, to pass those on and, and the recommendations that say you don't have to do that. It's only for, in essence, express disclosures of abuse. And, and mandates now view is um, that's not really going to pick up on lots of cases of abuse mm -hmm. in nature. And, I, you know, I do get that. I understand that fully. And, I, you know, I agree with a lot of that sentiment. But hopefully this is a start in place. Mm -hmm. and if we can get this in, we can then expand and show actually um, these are the other things we need to pick up on to try to prevent abuse mm. uh, and to act on it as soon as we possibly can. Mm, that's very positive, yeah, to actually see that it's a step. Yes. Not where we want to be getting to, but it's a step. That's, yeah, that's right, yeah, in my view anyway, but that, that is the right way of looking at it. Mm, mm, yeah, yeah, because I think in Alex Renton's book, uh, Stiff Upper Lip, he talks about this thing of only one in ten abuse cases people actually speak up and I know in my own experience, um, one of the things of boarding school, and I think this is the case of many schools, is you learn very quickly that one, you didn't speak up, you yeah. didn't grass anyone up, yeah, especially the teachers. And I resonate with what you were saying there about t names for the teachers. You know, we had names. It was we, you know, it's like we knew who was gay. And who, you know, we had this one phrase which, you know, backs the walls, as in yeah. he would bugger you. And it yeah, was like, yeah. And it was a bit of a joke. Mm. But actually, mm, wait a minute, this person's now in prison. So, yeah. And, and that's, uh, we've had a number of cases whereby people consider it to be banter or jokes, yeah. but actually there's no, um, uh, no smoke without fire i think the saying is mm. uh, and it's those phrases some of them are quite explicit um mm. actually um and uh denote um someone who is a child abuser you know the nicknames are quite clearly that mm. so it's not like um tall smith because you're tall it is it, quite clearly that and teachers hear it but they don't think well why are all the pupils calling him this mm. child abuser nickname um, but you would think, well, that's slightly strange. Perhaps I should investigate. And, and they didn't. And you're right, the repercussions of disclosing, and especially with boarding schools, boarding schools are a real issue. And on a, um, a safeguarding point of view and also a principal point of view, I, I, don't, dis I don't agree with boarding schools, in essence. Mm -hmm. um, I can see lots of abuse, and especially, you know, a number of my clients have been going to boarding schools from the age of eight, which just terrifies me. And mm -hmm to be um, emotionally detached from your parents. You can see the stenting in their development. Mm -hmm. You are forced to grow up. And some of my clients, when they talk about what they were doing at eight, I was doing when I was 18. There was so much more further advanced socially, perhaps, mm -hmm. but not emotionally. And mm -hmm. it's a real problem. And um, when you consider most boarding schools are, have got charitable status, mm -hmm. um, it so much has confused me. So mm -hmm. I don't want to target just boarding schools, but you can see they are open for abuse. And, and especially in this instance, if your parents had heard these nicknames about teachers, they probably would have said, well, why are you calling them that? Is something going on? Are they okay? Should they be teaching? Mm -hmm. Any of those questions don't happen, even though these teachers in our essence are you know, in local parentis, aren't they? In that 
They are, in essence, your parents. They cook for you. They clean for you. They make sure you don't hurt yourself. They put you to bed. They are, in essence, your parents, but they're not doing that key element. Um, the recommendations won't fix this issue because, of, like I said, you calling someone a child abuser nickname for a teacher. So mm -hmm. one, phrase, yeah, boom, one yeah. of my um, my friends, he said they used to write, and this he'd already left this teacher by the time I got there. They used to write when it was icy, pedo on his car. That was his name, pedo. It's like, hello? Yeah, that, that yeah. You'd think an alarm bell would ring. It's not the best case of Columbo or, or Miss Marple. <laughs> You'd think, you know, let's just consider it. You know, people, kids can make up names, etc. But you'd think, let's look into it. Let's have a chat about it. You know, you'd think the basic levels of investigation would take place. They mm -hmm. don't, but they didn't, but they still don't. Yeah. Um, and, and then when you find out a couple of years later, actually, mm -hmm. you know, there are allegations against them and they've been founded or he's admitted it. Mm -hmm. um, it is a, it's an issue. And I think that's the one thing we want to do. And just picking up on your point and that talking about the point of disclosure, you know, one in 10, like Alex said, Alex Renton, mm -hmm. It's also the age of disclosure and the research is fuzzy because of course it's only those who do disclose we know about but mm -hmm. most research indicates it takes about 26 years for a female to disclose mm -hmm. and 29 yeah. for a male so you're talking 40s but that's only from the ones who do disclose and obviously those stats would be totally distorted mm -hmm. if because some people never disclose so you die when you're 82 wherever the average is now mm -hmm. the odds would be much higher um, and that's the, one of the key things we want survivors to disclose. We want to make sure that help is available and support and specialist support. And we've had some bad experiences. You know, NHS is a fantastic institution, but mm -hmm. they can't do everything. Yeah. And you may see a therapist. Well, number one is the postcode lottery. So you can see a therapist in Cardiff or in Nottingham. May you have a six month wait list, may have nine, may only be able to see your therapist for six sessions. Um, they may not be specialists. They could be dealing with bereavement on a Monday and stress at work on a Tuesday, child abuse on a Wednesday. And what you do need is someone you can bond and connect with. And again, mm -hmm. that option. You don't need to see a male therapist if you're a male, but you may want to. You may want to see a female. That option, making sure you can speak to someone who's young or old, someone who's the same religion as you or knows about sport. You don't have to explain things to them. It's It's really important. So um, I apologize, I digress from your question, but there's so many different things which we need to look at. Mm. Mantra reporting is definitely one of them. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So it sounds like we have to wait a few months to see what until April to find out what the government's going to do. And when. And, and when. when. Yeah, because that's a time scale. Because the kids say we're going to do this. Mm. But how long will this take? A week? A year? Mm. Ten years? Remember, elections coming through. So there's only so much they can do practically before there is an election, which is in um, I can't remember when, sometime in 2024, isn't it? Yeah. And they need to get this signed off and passed through Parliament. Um, most of these things you'd hope would be passed through. But, but again, they've got so many other things to do. And there's so much backlog with numerous issues. So we want these things to be implemented as soon as possible. Um, but we just have to wait and see which ones they pick up on, which ones they advance, what do they advance, and when will they finally be law and implemented and in concrete rather than in um, pencil now, I suppose. Mm. Thank you. So what I'm almost hearing is, you know, we need to take responsibility ourselves. You mentioned about the Catholic priests or the, um, you know, some other religion not speaking up. Mm you know is it up to us as the lay people just to go oh actually i need to take full response i'm a scout leader myself i look after okay. 15 to 18 year old it's like if i see something it's like right immediately right i say something so yeah so it's a moral duty and, and i get that and, and um the one issue which we face the mandatory reporting doesn't just protect abuse survivors and other children it also protects the the whistleblower as such. Yeah. So let's so scout leader you don't get paid for, okay? Mm -hmm. Got it. But let's say you're a teacher. Let's say you've got uh, a family. You've got a partner. You've got children. You've got a mortgage. You've got to pay for your gas, which is increasing continuously. Mm -hmm. What do you do if you're not sure? No one said to you, Mister X is abusing this child, but you you've got lots of red lights. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Someone has wrote pedo on his car 
-hmm. children are coming out of his room after I was upset. Some children have just, behavior's changed. You've got red lights. Do you, as you said as a child, do you grasp? Do you report it? If you're not sure, it's an old boys network. It's a boarding school. Mm -hmm. What do you do? And if you're wrong, what happens to you? Mm -hmm. um, are you kicked out? Do you not get the pay rise, the promotion you would deserve or you want? Are these fears going through your head? Do you protect children or your own children? And I understand why sometimes good people do bad things. And going back to the very outset, you know, in, in, in Nazi Germany, mm -hmm. if you don't do these things, you will face repercussions. Are you a supporter of this sect of society, which we don't like, whether it's the black community, Jewish people? If you are, you're going to be killed. I understand mm -hmm. those pressures and the financial pressures as a teacher as well. I understand those. The mandatory reporting protects you as a whistleblower because you've got to do it. You're bound to do it. Yeah. So it takes that choice. Because what you just mentioned about the scout leader, you have a choice. And mm -hmm. you could do it. You're a volunteer. If you get kicked out of the scouts, you're like, so what? In, mm -hmm. in essence, you may be upset, but you know, fine. You're not going to be affected financially or um, reputationally or status-wise. But for a teacher, you could. And once you're out, you're out. And you want to get a referee for your reference, for your new job. Mm -hmm. it's the old boys network and it can affect you and even though it shouldn't do you can be tainted and people can whisper and so on so the management report would also protect the whistleblowers and i think that is really important at the moment yeah we're relying on people like you and your morals mm -hmm. to do it and that's great and you know we hope we can trust you in that scenario mm -hmm. but if you don't do it you just carry on with your life yeah. and um there should be repercussions for that i believe Mm, mm, mm. yeah 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 so thank you is there anything else about the ICSA so to help people understand because it was a long case I think it was 2014 uh, obviously you had lots of different people in charge you know I know from what people have said there was less publicity because it came out on the same day that Liz Truss resigned so there was very little publicity about it. Is there anything else you want to share about what was decided? Because it seems like from an outsider, the Scottish one seems to be a lot more proactive. Things are getting done. Whereas the British one, the English ones have been a bit, you know, from people who have been involved in the process, not done very well on one level. No. Yeah, I think I try to take the positive out of life. So I mm. think that you know spending maybe two hundred million pounds on something like this would help to raise awareness. You would hope, mm. um, and hope's very important to all survivors in society. But mm. you then need to follow through because mm. hope mm. without action is broken trust all over again. And survivors don't have a lot of trust to give out. It's really important. So to spend two hundred million pounds is is very important. You're right. The Scottish is a little, it is more proactive, and, and things have been more been done. But I think the key things from X is that they focused on institutions, which is very important. Mm -hmm. um, most abuse, however, happens in the family home. Yeah, um, yeah. Nearly, you know, a significantly high number, uh, percentage even, happens in the family home. That wasn't looked into at all because they just they couldn't. So, um, and then from the investigation strands, you know, I, I've acted in lots of cases within sport. Mm -hmm. Sport was not chosen as one of their strands, and I have talked about this numerous times, and that for all those boys who suffered abuse in football and, and girls, mm -hmm. those who suffered abuse in any sport, tennis, swimming, all overlooked. And the focus sometimes was on people like Lord Janna. And obviously it's important to understand how someone like him may or may not have um, committed abuse. Mm -hmm. um, and But the sheer numbers which he could have abused is obviously very different. And I think that's one thing which may have happened. Certain areas they've looked into, others they didn't. Um, focus was predominantly on England rather than Wales mm -hmm. and that's not coming from a, a semi-biased point of view you know, half Welsh, half Italian but actually just from sheer numbers if you have 10 people for England and Wales as an example and 9 of them are English or 9.5 you'd expect it to be proportionate wouldn't you mm -hmm. and it, it wasn't and, and I think the same for lots of these areas, which I could have looked into further, whether it's the military, whether it's sport, they just didn't do it. And that's disappointing after doing all of that. Um, 
and the length of time it took was also disappointing because you do want to see things moving and, and change mm-hmm. to happen. I think the thing for Ixa, before it published, I, I did a number of tweets saying this is what I hope it says. Mm-hmm. Uh, most of those were not done, um, unfortunately. And when we're looking towards law changes, what I'm really keen to do is is for change. I think when we talk about Ixa, depending on how you view it, it's either A, it's a sounding board, for want of a better phrase, or B, it's a vehicle for change. It could be both. Mm -hmm. But the vehicle for change could be changing the double jeopardy rules, could be re-looking at the criminal punishments to increase it. Mm -hmm. It could be really looking at the mandatory reporting. Um, Moving peers, you know, if you're um, Lord Ahmed who's been convicted of child abuse, you Mm -hmm. should have your title removed. You should be known as Lord Ahmed. You should be just known as your first name. But instead, that doesn't happen. All these kind of legal changes, and there's numerous others, uh, non-disclosure agreements, cover-ups, it could have been a real vehicle for change and improvement. And I think that didn't happen. And even for a sounding board, I do think, not looking into sport, where you've got nearly 900 men who came forward disclosing abuse within football, one sport, not to look into that at all is a failing, Mm -hmm. a massive failing. And that's, as you pointed out, if that's one in 10, we're talking about thousands. Um, If we're talking about other sports, tennis, swimming, gymnastics, athletics, and these other sports did come out um, and they have come out, you know, and the white review into gymnastics, the Sheldon review into football, um, abuse in North Wales and tennis, abuse in swimming, they're all individual. They weren't considered by ICSA. And that is a, a failing, to be frank. So even though it was a positive step, what we really need to see is change. And what I'm also keen to see, and it didn't happen, is to have a review every, let's say, five years. Mm-hmm. Because it's all good, you go in, all great. You know, do an Ofsted check on the school, all great, never look at this again. Or do a health review on a restaurant, five out of five on health rating, but never look at it again. Check it in five years. Did your recommendations, number one, did they happen? Number two, did they make a difference? Mm-hmm. Number three, what must we do to improve? And just continue it. I think we can't just have this snapshot of, you know, life, 2022, that's it. Mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep on doing it. You can't rest on your laurels when you're talking about children's welfare. Mm -hmm. And and unfortunately, that isn't something which I I don't know will happen. I hope these measures have been put in place by five years at least. Mm -hmm. And we are seeing changes, but um, we need to keep on it. And what you said, you know, the power is with the people. And I think everyone should be trying to reach out to their MPs and others and go, and actually, when are these things going to be done? Because mm-hmm. otherwise, we're going to have another generation of children who suffered abuse mm-hmm. and are going to be uh, an impact on society and on the economy and the like, whereby it's you know, reduced earnings, increased therapy needs, drug use, drink use, you know, mm-hmm. prison, crime, criminal justice system for their own criminal crimes, and broken down relationships and impacts on them. Let's help these individuals. It's really mm-hmm. important. So um, yeah, in summary, it's a good step in a way. Mm-hmm. We do need to see what the final result of all of that time and money and input is, which we still don't know really. Mm-hmm. And is there something in place to actually follow this up in five years? To, to have a look and go, right, how did that go? I think we just need to keep on pushing it. I think that's the key point. I think we just have to keep on pushing it. You know, we're going to bring in mandatory reporting as an example. Well, number one, will they bring it in? If they do bring it in, does it work or not? Mm-hmm. If it doesn't work, how do we change it? Mm-hmm. We can't just allow these things to go. You wouldn't do it in any other business. You know, if you have a hole in your roof, you fix the hole. If it's still dripping, you, I would hope you have another look at it. You just go, well, I fixed it. it, it you can't do that. Mm-hmm. So, the question is about money often, um, mm. especially mm. now. Do they have the money to provide proper support and therapy for every abuse survivor? Mm. Do they have a, the money to fix the criminal justice system? Do they have the money and the energy and the inclination to, to make a real change and to try to either A, prevent abuse, B, to make sure survivors can disclose when they are, let's say, 15 rather in their 40s, mm. um, and C, to make sure that everyone associated to this crime is punished for it to try to act as a deterrent and also to enact change, that systematic change I mentioned at the very start, because that's the only way we can do it. The system needs to get these monsters out 
Mm-hmm. And if they, we can't, as soon as we identify the monsters, get them. Mm-hmm. Um, at the moment, the system clearly doesn't work with total respect. And, you know, it's not an issue from the 70s, 80s. I've still got clients in the last couple of years, you know, two years, five years, still mm-hmm. suffering abuse within the Scout Association, mm-hmm. within boarding schools, within churches. So it's still an issue. And people ask me often, you know, is it better? Mm-hmm. Um, the answer is still no. It still takes those children, those 20, 30 years to disclose. There's still an inherent issue still there. And people ask, is it worse in England or Wales compared to other countries? I think we talk about these issues a lot more now and a lot more open. But sadly, abuse happens everywhere. It's not an English issue. It's not a Welsh issue. It's not a boarding school issue. It is everywhere. And the sooner we realize that and it's still happening, the sooner we will hopefully try to fix this problem rather than thinking it's an issue in the past. Mm, mm, mm. Um, And just the one last thing, sorry, about ICSA, which is very important, Mm. is that um, Boris Johnson, when he was considering the money spent on ICSA, did an LBC interview. And he said that the money spent on investigating the historical child sexual abuse offences, such as through ICSA, was money spaffed up the wall, which means ejaculated up the wall. Mm -hmm. Um, Awful term of phrase, Mm -hmm. uh, considering the context we're talking about, but also an awful sentiment. You know, he thought investigating this was a waste of money. Mm -hmm. That does concern me. What other politicians think that? If you think that, you're not going to act on it. And Mm -hmm. that is a concern for me personally. Mm -hmm. Um, And, you know, I say... Boris Johnson, because he's the one who said it. There may be others who have mentioned this, who have considered it, who have not said it so openly or so um, uh, violently, I suppose, in the manner he did. Mm. But it, it is a concern. We need action and we need the MPs to enact these laws. Mm. Thank you. And that's kind of something I'm wondering. Thank you for bringing up Boris Johnson, because that was in my mind about what he said. Mm. Because you know, he was at the same school as Alex Renton around the same time. And as you probably yeah. know, there was sexual abuse at Ashdown House yeah. Yeah. at that time, Yeah, you know, and, you know, from what Alex was saying in the book is it was that teacher was then given a reference to go off to another secondary school. Yeah. And he went on and continued to abuse people. And that, for me, I'm wondering personally, because the boarding school and where a lot of our leaders and I think someone said 63 percent of the high court judges, you know, head of BBC, head of Channel 4, head of MI6 have all been to these institutions. And what I felt there, and it sounds like similar where Boris was at school, it's this homoerotic environment, you know, this. It's quite uncomfortable being there because there's a lot of sexual energy there's these teachers which are predating on it so it's kind of normalized so when these people come into positions of power you know they're not necessarily integrated they're still carrying this trauma i think that yeah boarding schools per se are an issue from social development Mm. um and whether it's single sex or not but the Mm. clear essence of boarding schools are a inherent uh, clearly inherent problem and we see that you know you're right you know nick clegg was the um deputy prime minister went to caldicott school abuse mm-hmm. happened there mm-hmm. rishi sunak went to winchester um and it's a, it's a problem and i think alex's title of his book is so true you know stiff mm-hmm. upper lip um, also known as emotional stunting of your life mm-hmm. um, depending on which way you look at it you do have to be resilient in life you have to be resilient to be a lawyer and a teacher and a doctor and a mum and a dad you have to have that emotional resilience and to a certain extent <coughs> but it can't be emotional blindness mm-hmm. and i think that often that does factor in to these issues um and it's it's a problem it is mm-hmm. no shine away from it and um the one thing which we do need to, to really kind of break really is that cycle of abuse mm-hmm. and the system failures. It, it's really important. And, and we're going to have to see in the next couple of months actually what those changes are. Mm-hmm. The one thing I would say to every abuse survivor is to still come forward, disclose. Mm-hmm. There is mm-hmm. support available, numerous abuse charities which are in place. Um, 
And that's really important for that kind of path of recovery, for want of a better phrase. It is important. It's, it's helpful to talk and to discuss. But we also need to be ready to listen. It's a balanced view, which I'm trying to give, in that we have to listen, we have to act. So it's talk, listen, act. At the moment, there is a breakdown in those three components. Um, there clearly is, and, and we need to do a lot better on it. And when people do make mistakes and people do say things like Johnson did, where it was a mistake, where it was a clear intention, and he's never apologized for it, he never is, it's, you know, there's probably no weight behind it now. But it's the, it's not what he said, but it's how and what was going through his head, you know, and if he was still leader of this country and, and, and would he implement those 20 recommendations? Mm. On what level would he do so? It's a real concern. Um, and, you know, Rishi Sunak, who's the current prime minister at the time of this um, podcast anyway, mm -hmm. you know, he went to Winchester and again, it's been allocated to abuse there and, and so on. Mm -hmm. We targeting perhaps boarding schools and I may be doing that unfairly, but the fact that there's so much abuse there and it replicates itself in other areas and mm -hmm. the abuse which you see, Catholic Church, Church of England, boarding school, state school, it's the system. It's very similar in each area, slightly different, mm -hmm. but also very similar. And we need to appreciate that and act on it. But it's it's taken a while for change to take place. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And is that, I'd love you to speak a bit about, say, some of the quite well-known cases, Jimmy Savile or, you know, the other one was uh, John Smythe or Bishop Peter Ball. Yeah. You know, I'd love you to share a little bit about, you know, how did that, you know, how did Jimmy Savile kind of, did it go on for so long? I mean, I, I watched a, an interview with John Lydon in that was the eighties or seventies or eighties. And he said something along the lines about, you know, Jimmy Savile being, you know, you need to investigate him and he got canceled. He got thrown out of the BBC. I'm just intrigued. How did we let it go on yeah. for so long? I think, well, one part of it is down to mandatory reporting. So we've seen this within uh, drugs and cycling, for example. Those people who reported Lance Armstrong, they got kicked off the team. Um, similar to Jimmy Savile, as you mentioned, those people who reported concerns lost mm -hmm. their jobs. So my hypothetical, in a way, teacher example, which I gave you, mm -hmm. isn't. It's real life. So if you do that, and once you're out, you're out. Mm -hmm. And it's a real problem because what do you do? How do you get a job? How do you pay your bills? for doing the right thing. Mm -hmm. And I think when we talk about those abusers and, and lots of teachers, what you will notice is it's not one time, it's not one abuse survivor or victim. It's numerous over a numerous period of time. And with teachers and priests and football coaches and others, they move on elsewhere. Often it's in numerous schools, numerous churches. Now you could be um, a believer and believe no one knew. No one was aware. There was no warning signs and the like. Mm. And, and sometimes that may be true, but often there are concerns and there are warning signs and there are people writing pedo on someone's car, for example. Mm. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be as explicit as that, but often there's other signs. Mm. And I think it comes down to that thing about um, protecting oneself rather than others. Mm. Um, the fear of being wrong. Um, we've seen that also with Rotherham and Rochdale and Telford. You know, if we're wrong, we may be termed racist. Mm -hmm. um, most abuse is by white men, to be frank. Mm -hmm. Most mm -hmm. the men, most abuse is by men, but women also abuse. Mm -hmm. um, but most is by men. And I think it's just that fear um, of, of being wrong. But my question is, you know, are you never worried about being right? Um, and it's easy for me to say, but I would hope that would be right. And we did see, again, going back to Nazi Germany, we saw lots of cases whereby people did stand up for what they believed. They did lose their lives for it, but mm -hmm. they did do that. It, it's just that balance. We need to give whistleblowers as much help as we can. It's system errors. Mm -hmm. We need to do better to prevent it. Most abusers don't have criminal records before going into schools and churches and sport clubs for obvious reasons, or else you wouldn't get in. Um, but once they're in, it's just that constant monitoring it's not, you know, 1984 or anything. It's just, it has to be. It's not just you're inside, you're fine now. We need to keep on monitoring. It's why mind reporting is so important in my view. It's mm. not a magic wand, but it's a helpful wand at the same time. Mm. Um, and we need to do better at that. And when you talk about people like Peter Ball, 
very high profile supporters for example um yeah, and... to come to to my school and do um, confirmations and yeah. the kids who were struggling used to get sent to him in the holidays yeah uh, are you feeling and... unhappy go and see peter ball oh yeah 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 it, it's a concern it's a real concern and same for jimmy savile and others these people um it, there's a saying it, it takes a, a village to raise a child which means it's not just down to you as a parent mm -hmm. you've got to have grandparents and siblings and all the rest of it i've always considered it takes a village to abuse a child yeah. um because lots of my clients have huge elements of blame and guilt why did i not talk why don't disclose i could have saved my my brothers from that school i could have saved um other children i could have stopped the abuse but actually the abuser has groomed and manipulated you they've groomed and manipulated often your parents if it's a church or sports setting or elsewhere they've groomed their colleagues often mm -hmm. and, and it is that entire crime it's a unique crime when you consider it Mm -hmm. if i wanted to steal your tv for example and i came into your house mm -hmm. i assume you wouldn't help me put it in my car <laughs> and i assume you would tell the police wouldn't you say someone's just stolen my tv mm -hmm. or if i stabbed you i assume you wouldn't help me to do it and i assume you would tell a doctor you wouldn't cover up for me mm -hmm. with abuse mm -hmm. it's a unique crime is it often there's often not a gun to someone's head it's usually manipulation and grooming Mm. Um, and that really confuses children because it's a key mm. developmental stage um, of their life. Um, often their first sexual experience is very damaging. Mm. But secondly, they're told, or the inherent nature of the abuse means they're so embarrassed and ashamed and fearful, they never disclose. So not only have you now stolen my TV, I'm now going to cover up for you for, let's say, 29 years, and then tell someone. And then people say, well, why didn't you tell someone? That someone stole your TV 29 years ago. It's victim blaming at its highest. Mm -hmm. And it's a real fear. When you find out actually there was someone else who watched someone steal my TV, you do think, well, why didn't you say something? Mm -hmm. Where's your shame? Where's your embarrassment? Where's your fear? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's why it's such a unique crime. It's so confusing. Mm -hmm. um, and it's untreated for so long. So it, it's uh, that's how abuse can take place for so long because it's a victimless crime for, for such a long period of time. Mm. And those witnesses who do witness the crimes or the symptoms of the crime don't do anything. So they operate in, in plain dead um, daylight. And going back to what my mum said, you know, stranger danger, don't take those sweets from the stranger. Mm. As I said, she never said about my, my priest, my teachers, my sports coaches, my father, my uncles, none of those operate in plain sight um mm. and that's the the real issue is it's a real killer actually mm. in relation to people's mental health and, and and sometimes their actual health as well yeah mm, thank you so i'm aware we're coming up towards an hour which uh does go <laughs> quickly <laughs> so, uh, i would love for you to just say how can we help you because i think what the work you're doing is amazing how can the listeners you know get behind you and go yeah is it you know what might be some things that we can do whether it's contacting our um, member of parliament what can we do to really get this ball rolling and um, make this mandatory or whatever yeah so some of the key things is, is number one if you know if, if anyone of your listeners have suffered abuse is to talk mm. whether it's to uh, you know a loved one to a friend you trust to a therapist to the police to a lawyer whoever it is talk to someone um it's not your burden to carry it should never be mm -hmm. um, but it has been for far too long so that's the first thing secondly for any therapists police officers mps is to make sure there's no longer a tick box exercise listen mm -hmm. and act if something isn't working if the system's broken fix it change mm -hmm. it um it's so important third is to consider the long-term impact far too often we look at the the, the short term Mm -hmm. um we won't treat you until you are suicidal we won't treat you until you need to have a new liver for alcohol abuse mm -hmm. treat them at the outset we won't need to get to that stage you can save years save money save that person's life save the economy and so on i think um, reach out to abuse charities and try to support them where you can where it's donations 
whether it's a part of your will, whether it's charity runs, raising awareness of abuse charities, your local ones and nationwide, giving them support will take away some of the stigma, which unfortunately still exists about abuse. You watch a London Marathon. Mm -hmm. Have you ever seen an abuse charity? You see heart, you see cancer, and they're very important. I'm not dismissing it at all. Mm -hmm. But where are you know sexual abuse charities? And if you did see it, imagine if you're a six-year-old girl or boy and you see someone, they put the camera in the person's face, who are you running for? I'm running for this abusive charity. It, it removes this element of, of shame and embarrassment about talking about sex and abuse. And mm. it is about abuse first. And I hope you noted that. I talk about abuse. The sex is a, an act. The abuse is the impact. And actually what's taking place, you're, you're abusing someone. Um, there's a number of campaigns which... Uh, I'm taking at the moment trying to pursue to try to change the law. Please contact me if you want to know about them. Any information, any queries, if you want to find out more about the campaigns, just contact me. I can send the articles, send the things we're doing. But we do need the people to act and to push these things on, to show actually this is a priority, mm -hmm. not just for abuse survivors, but for their families, their friends, their workplaces, society in general. Mm -hmm. If you consider the one in 10, which you mentioned, we know how many abuse survivors there are in this country based on ICSA and the Truth Project and elsewhere. If Alex is right, and I don't doubt him actually, mm -hmm. we're talking about a significant number of people affected in this country. Then you tell, talk about their parents, their children, their partners and others. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a large number. Mm -hmm. um, we need to do better because we're all going to be affected by this. You may not know someone who has been affected, but they have been. Mm -hmm. and i think that's the key thing so um yeah i'm happy for you to share my details i'm happy to speak to anyone at all and i really appreciate you mm -hmm. asking me on and i'll be keen to do more in the future i think it's a really important thing which you're mm -hmm. doing talking about these issues whether it's mental health or it's abuse whether it's the law or change or all of them mm -hmm. talking is is so key and so important so i, I really am grateful for you asking me to come on today mm -hmm. Mm, well, a pleasure i really think your work you're doing is really great um i think it's so important and i do feel very passionate about it because things don't seem to be changing so having people like you going whoa no things need to change yeah. you know and i love mandate now and the other organizations who are doing this so um yeah as i say to all my guests if i can support in any way you know maybe coming on in six months again and you know, you sharing more about actually what happened. Did they, did they do anything? <laughs> yeah. They go, yeah. oh, well, no, that's, <laughs> that's not enough. Yeah, that'd be good. Um, but great. So what I'll do is I'll put your um, website details into the bottom. Uh, I've also put in your blog posts into the description so okay. people can read because I've, I've read quite a few of them, thought they were, were, were great um and also yeah when people want to reach out to you maybe i'll put in i'll have a look up for some um, of the abuse charities that people can support uh, oh, as well so well thank you so much indeed dina thanks Piers. okay